Looking for a job isn't easy. It used to be that you could apply at a big name tech company and build a great career for yourself. But times have changed. Many of these companies have gone full woke. And if you aren't the right gender, ethnicity, you don't use pronouns, or if you're not an activist for the preferred cause, then good luck. Why would you risk your career on that? At Red Balloon, we're connecting good employees with top quality companies that value you for your skills and your work ethic, not your social activism score. Employers who post jobs on Red Balloon are focused on creating an enjoyable and productive work culture, free from divisive woke mandates. So if you want to find a serious career path without the nonsense, come to Red Balloon and post your resume today because you shouldn't have to choose between your job and your values. That's redballoon.work, where you can find your future. Hey y'all, welcome to Cross Politics on the Fight Life Feast Network, Pastor Toby Chuck Knox on the water boy. This is a powder puff, you know, Cross Politic crossover show. What? <laughs> What? That's what it is. What? Maybe, maybe not. You got, you no. got to stick around, actually. Now, now you got to figure out what. Now you're curious. Yeah. I, wow. It was pretty hilarious. They, they had to explain to me the joke from the other day about about little, little, black little, little, mermaid. Little, mermaid. little mermaid not yeah. being able to swim. Right. I, apparently, I don't know if I don't have enough black friends. Well, or I'm not doing my job. I take, I take the blame for that. You should know that when it's on me. That's but, but apparently our producer tells us that Black Little Mermaid really couldn't swim. <laughs> and so they had to CGI. Not surprised. All, all her, her, uh, yeah, if she, you don't know what we're yeah, talking about, yeah. you need to go back and catch Watch the other, that, show. other that's, show. That's true. Jesus is Lord in public and in private. Every area of life must be subject to his lordship. And our use of technology is no exception. What captures our attention on the screen either glorifies or dishonors our Lord. That's why Accountable to You is committed to promoting biblical accountability in our families and churches. Their monitoring and reporting software makes transparency easy on all your devices so you can say with the psalmist, I will not set anything worthless before my eyes. So guard against temptation with Accountable to You. That's the word accountable, the number two, the word you, and live for God's glory. Learn more. Try it for free today at accountable to you.com slash F L F. We're very grateful to have with us uh, on the show. Mr. Chris Savino. I wonder if he can swim. (laughs) He's white, so he probably can swim. He's the creator of the award-winning hit animated cartoon series, The Loud House, which which you were playing some of it earlier for me. I was was wondering why we were listening to it. On uh, Nickelodeon, and has worked on many other hit shows, such as Dexter's Laboratory, The Powerpuff Girls. Oh, I see. Okay, that's the connection. Kick Batowski and Samurai Jack. He is an advisory board member with Lore TV and is the creator of Busted Bible Stories, which will fund and stream on Lore. Chris, I want to talk about that. Thanks for joining us on Cross Politic. Well, thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here. I follow all three of you, and I'm glad to be talking to you live. Wow. 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 Follow, follow us where? <laughs> where? Where are you following? Uh, down us? the street. Look oh, over your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was afraid of. That's what I was afraid like, of. Like, I the knew. F- like the FBI. I knew, yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, Chris, so we, we've heard that you came to know Christ in the middle of the Me Too movement. Uh, tell, us, oh. tell us the story. Man, not even the middle, right at the very beginning. And it was a feeding frenzy. Um, you know, it's been almost six years. So and I've told this story so many times. So I'm just going to ask up front to forgive anybody. Forgive me for sounding like I'm not contrite and that I'm speeding through this. I know we are limited on time and I don't want it to seem like the things I'm saying, I'm just glossing over. Mm. That's it. Uh, You mentioned the Loud House. Um, I've worked in animation since 1991. um, And throughout my career, I was fortunate enough. And I'm just going to skip ahead. I always say I was lucky. I was in the right place at the right time to, to, to work on some of these amazing shows with, amazing, talented people. But now that Christ is in my life, I look back and go, no, 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 no. God was there and he was putting me in those places and he was making those things uh, available to me. Um, And so if I say lucky, I mean God. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So, yeah. So I had worked in animation for, for about 25 years when, um, well, let's say 2015, uh, I sold 
and started producing The Loud House. And it aired, I believe, 2016. Um, and lo and behold, the show was a hit. You know, it was um, one of those right place, right time things where you can never know what the audience is going to latch on to. Yeah. And um, it was doing well in the ratings. I was hearing things like crazy enough that like, oh, you saved Nickelodeon with your show. Things that make your head explode when you hear them. Like, hey, we were at a meeting at Disney the other day and they were all saying, where's our loud house? Those things that can make your ego explode. Um, but you try and maintain like an even keel. But it was exciting and the show was doing well. Um, and I, I, you know, I guess I could say I had it all. If you take a step back and look at my life at that point, I had a, 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 a great family, a great wife, great kids, a, a house uh, in Los Angeles of all places, and um, and a hit television show on Nickelodeon. It was amazing. But what people didn't know, and what I kind of really came to terms with a little bit later on, was that. There was something missing in my life. And I, and even though I had all of these things, I was either secretly or sometimes overtly looking for more. It was just never enough. I had uh, what turned out to be an addiction to alcohol, turned out to be an addiction to work, and unfortunately, an addiction to, we'll say, attention from the opposite sex. Um, and all three of those things combined made for a really terrible uh, existence for me. Um, and in the fall, October of 2017, all of those things caught up with me. Uh, the Me Too movement had just gotten started. Uh, the Weinstein name was in the news really big and suddenly so was mine. Uh, it turns out that, uh, um, besides the alcohol and the work, the, the, the women who I, was in contact with decided enough was enough from me and uh decided to call me out um publicly and like i said it was early on and it was a feeding frenzy frenzy and uh before i knew it within days my name was all over the internet uh people were talking about me and gossiping about me and the he said she said thing was kind of exploding and i it was like it was like a snowball I had no control over, an avalanche wow. of wow. just anger and hatred and really not really knowing the full story. But at the point where I was able to even say anything, I couldn't. People didn't want an apology. They didn't want to hear what I had to say. All they wanted to be was mad. And, um, and I would say from that October day, within five days... Nickelodeon had severed ties with me. They took my show from me. They took my job from me. I lost my career. I lost my, my wife and I lost my home. And unfortunately I was like right on the edge of losing my kids too. They were in their like nine year old to 16 year old range where they could sort of understand what was going on, but not understand. And ultimately they could end up hating dad. Um, for the things that they were reading online, a lot of the lies I had to sit down with my kids where you're normally having the, the talk, uh, <laughs> I was having to give them the talk about dad and what he had been doing, which was just being an, a, a, a terrible father and an unfaithful husband. Uh -huh. And I had to, you know, re re uh, establish a relationship with those four people in my life and to regain a, a trust that I knew that I had killed. And that was my goal from that point forward was like, I've got to fix this thing. And yeah, I got to say, I was worried that I was never going to work again. I was never going to work in animation again. Um, and I was seeking forgiveness from a group of people that did not want to give it. Uh, and just to skip ahead a little bit, I realized just a couple months later that the forgiveness that I was looking for were not from people. Um, and we can get to that shortly. So, um, so that was it. It, you know, I, I kept my mouth shut for that time. Um, it was, I didn't want it to, to seem like I was, um, um, 
responding to what was being said in kind of a a way that I was making excuses. I took a hundred percent of the responsibility uh, to the situation and took it all on myself, um, regardless of of any of the lies that were being said. And the how would you say it, it was like a um, a group of people working in concert together to just destroy me and my career. And it, and it worked, it worked, um, quite well. And, you know, I say these things and I feel like, you know, I'm not looking for anybody to feel sorry for me when I say that it hurt, like I wanted to die. I know that if I had still been drinking at that time, I certainly would have drunken myself to death. None of those things are to garner any sort of sympathy, but it is to show that there are human beings on both sides of this story. And that not only was I affected, but my my ex-wife and my kids were affected without any sort of of um, censoring from the, we'll say the other side, for lack of better terms, um, without any care that they, the, the, the heartache that they were causing them with the words that they were using. Um, of course, again, I, I, like I said, I take full responsibility that, that I was in that situation and my family was in that situation. It was just a rough rough time. And here we are six years later. Um, I'm actually happy to say that today, this very day is my six years of sobriety. Um, and I'm grateful for that. I do know that if, if, uh, again, looking back, if, had I not quit drinking, it was, gosh, it was just two months before the, my life fell out from underneath me. Like I said, I would have definitely, you know, been at the bottom of a bottle, yeah. uh, probably not alive today. So, so at, at, at what at what point did you meet Christ and all that? It sounds like you kind of went through the ringer and oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, you know, I I, I want to say that there was not religion in my house growing up. My mom was Catholic, my dad was Catholic. I'm from a family of ten, and the first few kids were baptized and and had first communion and all that. But by the time they got to number nine, which was me, church was not part of my my household. And it had occurred to me over the years um, to maybe look into it, but it, it just never took. It never was something that I felt I needed in my life. And so what it does take sometimes, unfortunately, is just hitting rock bottom, like yeah. losing everything in your life, all the good things that were given to me and all the good things that I worked so hard for, to lose all of those is the perfect time to find Christ because he is there in that turmoil. He's right there just whispering, saying, you need me. And, you know, I, it was in January of 2018, just a couple of months later, I had moved out of my home. I was living in a single apartment in Burbank, um, afraid to go out. Like the, I didn't want to be walking down the street, to see anybody I knew. And I was literally sitting in my bed one night and I said this out loud and I've said this on all my interviews. I actually said out loud, I was talking to myself about like, well, what was missing in my life that I had all of these things. And I was so willing to just do things that were going to jeopardize them. And I said out loud is it just kind of popped in my head. I don't know where, but it popped in my head is, is, God missing from my life. And I remember stuttering that out loud. Like I couldn't even believe I was saying. <laughs> so I looked, I looked into, it. I started looking into it. I started watching some videos online. Um, there were fortunately one or two people in my life in the, from the animation industry that I knew were Christian, that I knew that if I reached out to them, a, it could be terrible or B, they could be real Christian people and have some amount of compassion to respond and fortunately, they did respond. And one gal said, you know, you ought to read um, Mere Christianity. And I was like, I hadn't even heard of it at that point. I knew C.S. Lewis from the um, Narnia books, right. but I didn't know he was a Christian. I didn't know any of the, the Christian side of him, which I started reading and I loved it. And my other friend um, both worked on The Loud House. She said, you know, she tried to explain to me what the gift of grace was. And I was like, there's no way God has given me grace in this situation. I felt horrible. Like there's no way he's forgiving me 
and offering me forgiveness in this situation. I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it, that it was personal to me. Mm. And she was attending a church in North Hollywood and said, you know, you ought to come to this church one Sunday uh, and see what you think. I'm like, well, we'll see. Um, I still was not sold on it. But nonetheless, I'm a person who, when there's something that interests me, I will dive right in and dig deep on it, which I did. And something about the Bible itself, I had no idea. I thought I, had, I thought I knew what was in the Bible, but I didn't know it was in the Bible. And I started reading it and, uh, and, and how the Old Testament and the New Testament are connected and how Jesus existed in the Old Testament through every single book, mm. et cetera. And it was just fascinating to me. Even And I've said this before, even if I just remained secular, I still think I would be so in- interested in the Bible itself and who wrote it and why and all of those things and it's connected tissue, the, the hyperlinks that exist within it. I think I'd still be into it regardless. The same way I am fascinated by UFOs or Bigfoot, all those things fascinate me. But the Bible, like I was just blown away by it. I decided, okay, I will go to that church. Um, Sunday morning, first or second week of February, I went in. Pastor started delivering his message after some rock music had played, which I was shocked by. I didn't realize that's what church was. Um, And he, I swear, it's like, and I'm not exaggerating. You know, sometimes you can exaggerate a story in hindsight. It felt like the audience disappeared and a giant spotlight was on me. It was like a movie. And he was up on stage and just talking to me. And I started, I felt like, oh my gosh, did they reach out to the pastor and explain that I was going to be here and tell them my story. And this is what he chose to talk about today, which I know isn't true, but I, I literally burst into tears. I just started crying right in. I, we were in the front row because we were late. Um, <laughs> and I like this, it was all of this emotion from the last two months just poured out of me. And I felt like, yeah, I felt like finally somebody was showing compassion and it wasn't a human being. Um, so I dug deeper. I continued going to church and by May, the first week of May, two months later, um, I had decided to get baptized and I got baptized, um, May 6th, uh, 2018. And I tell you, I haven't missed a Sunday of church unless I was super sick or out of town. Um, and when I do miss them, I watch them online and it was then that I realized that the thing that I was looking for with the, with the forgiveness from people needed to come from God first. And when I felt forgiven by him, I felt like this floodgate open of like how I can be okay with however long forgiveness might take with my ex-wife and with my kids, Mm. uh, I needed to put the work in, in which the last six years, man, I got to tell you, the relationship with my boys it has never been better. Um, I, they're open to ask and allowed to ask any questions they want about it. And um, my ex-wife and I, even though we, we did get divorced, she lives in Colorado. I live here in Texas now. Uh, we have a better relationship now and a more open relationship now verbally. Um, and we co-parent and I think we're doing okay. Um, she has said the words, I forgive you, but I, you know, I'm one of those people that like, I just, I, the, the guilt inside of me is hard to get rid of. And the, um, the feeling like I will never, ever, ever be sorry enough to her and to my boys to what, what kind of, um, problems I brought to our family and and shame that I brought to our family and our name, not only locally, but man, I got to tell you, when my name showed up on CNN (laughs) and my son said he was sitting in class and they were watching CNN for some project and my name came up, the embarrassment, he must have felt like I could never, I could never say I'm sorry enough to him and, and make that up to him in any way, shape or form. Wow. You know, Um, uh, uh, it, it struck me when you were talking about before you were a Christian, how you couldn't understand the concept of grace. How, how does grace, <laughs> yeah. you know, I've messed up big times, destroyed, rocked my family's life, uh, lost my job, all this stuff. 
what does grace mean in that moment? And an and unbeliever can't understand grace right? in that moment. I mean, you don't have a category for it, and you don't know how to experience it. Right. Um, and, but then, you know, I mean, how beautiful is the gospel in that moment or in that life as you come to as you come to understand like 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 that forgiveness oh amen. That, that washed away all that baggage all that sin you'd been carrying you know not only your marriage with alcohol and everything else um but that's what grace is it it you you can't understand it being in darkness walking in darkness you can't understand what grace is and 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 to be walking in the light all of a sudden like it, it's it's like you you don't have a category now for not living without that grace. Yeah. True. Yes, yes, yes. And I got to say like it, it, it's a situation where it really had nothing to do with the people that I was hoping would forgive me. None of that. And it's so funny because I talk about this and I connect the testimony with what had happened. And of course, what I realize is everybody wanted to say like, Oh, well, he's, fake. He's a fake Christian because he wants everybody to think he's a good guy now. And I just can't believe like really people are saying this kind of stuff. And I, and I just needed to separate those two things. And like my journey now has nothing to do with my past. It's moving forward. And, And I've had so many testimonies along the way. I had a pastor once say, your testimony doesn't end with when you came to Christ, your testimony continues. And boy, God has just been there These last six years, I mean, clearly I haven't been working or been able to provide for my family doing that, the work that I love, but boy, he has sustained us in every way possible from that point forward. And it's been six years. It could have very easily been just destitute, but, you know, thank, thank God that we haven't been. And, and he, again, looking back to those previous years, even when I wasn't a believer, he was putting things in place to say, look, it's going to be okay. And if I had been a believer when everything fell out from underneath me, I think I would have been, I think I felt like everything that happened would have been punishment. But now, but having come to Christ uh-huh. after the fact, I can look at it and see that God actually saved my life by taking those things away. And it's hard to explain like, wow, you lost everything and you, th- and you think that's a good thing. Huh. Yes. Because I have no idea. I have a feeling like the path that I was on, the self-destructive behavior would have been a far worse and probably far more destructive to other people than just myself and my, my job. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Man, yeah, it really yeah. is. You know, I, I want to know, you know, you said when you read the Bible that it just kind of like, wow, what is this? This is amazing. Mm-hmm. As a storyteller, coming to the Bible and seeing all the connected tissues, you're probably like extremely fascinated. Like all the stories are here that I'm that are amazing. That I want to tell. What are some of the things that stuck out to you when you start reading the Bible mm-hmm. as a storyteller? It's funny you should say that, that there was a story, that it was a, especially the Old Testament. I had no idea that it was. A, oh, I knew Genesis, but from the beginning to the end of the the um, what is it, the second temple era, um, that it was a story, and we were following, which I didn't learn until a little bit later. We were following God's redemptive plan for humans. I had no idea what that's mm. what that was, and that there are all of the things that we as storytellers, when we're learning the craft of it and how to, to tell a story and build up suspense and have payoffs and setups that are set up early on that pay off later on, all of those tricks that we use in storytelling are in the Bible. It's just like, it's like one of the oldest stories ever told. And it's funny because I, you know, in that downtime, um, I wrote a book on how to, how to write cartoons in four acts and hard to explain time-wise here about what four acts is, but I actually applied the, those four acts, that structure to the story of Christ in the new Testament, beginning, middle and end. And of course, continuation. And it worked. It's not like my technique worked. It's just that the, the story of the Bible is one of the most perfect stories ever told that it will fit into those paradigms um, that either subconsciously or consciously we have pulled 
from the 2000 years of people telling this story and applied it to our own storytelling. It's, and it, yeah. it made me smile so much when I, when I connected all those dots. <laughs> it's built into creation. All right. Yeah. I, I, I got a, I got a follow up question, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I got to read this ad real quick. Uh, not so long ago, the American dream was alive and well employees who worked hard were rewarded and employers looked for people who could do the job, not for people who had the right political views. Redballoon.work is a job site designed to get us back to what made American businesses successful. Free speech, hard work, and having fun. If you're a free speech employer who wants to hire employees who focus on their work and not identity politics, then post a job on Redballoon.work. If you're an employee who is being censored at work or is being forced to comply with the current zeitgeist, Post your resume on redballoon.work and look for a new job today. Redballoon.work, the job site where free speech is still alive. Redballoon.work. Chris, um, you, but not only are you a storyteller, not only have you been a storyteller, you've been a storyteller for kids. Mm. Um, and I, and I'm curious, so take some of the, maybe some of the storytelling uh, stuff, but I'm curious how, how did you think about telling stories for kids? I mean, what were your goals? Yeah. Um, how did you think about that even even before you met Christ? And and then, but then maybe tell us the transition as you've come to know the Lord, as you've come to know the Bible, as you've come to see you know Christ working you know, the story of your life. Um, I know you're you're getting ready. You're starting work, maybe on making some children's shows for Lore TV. Um, how, how has that transition shaped how you think about? telling stories now. So how did, how did you, and how are you thinking about telling uh, children's stories now? Okay. Good question. Well, fortunately growing up, I mean, boy, from early age, the cartoons that were on TV for me were like Rocky and Bullwinkle, Underdog, Popeye. Mm -hmm. um, and a little bit later on when cable TV was a new thing, um, the Looney Tunes shorts, um, I, 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 I knew I wanted to be a comic strip artist. I knew I wanted to draw for the Sunday funnies. That was my goal and my main um, focus in, in how I drew and what I drew, but I did watch cartoons. And I think a lot of the storytelling came from that and connecting it to you. Like, how do you write for kids? It really isn't. How do you write for kids? It was, I'm writing this for only one person and that's me. And if a few kids like it, then great. I've done my job, but I really just wanted to make myself laugh. Like this was a cartoon that I would want to watch when I was a kid. And Rocky and Bullwinkle is a good example of that where, you know, it's, it's silly and the characters are silly and their voices are silly. But if you go and you watch them now, they had some really heady content in them and, some of the references they made were very adult, um, but it works on so many levels. Um, but what I did learn is when you're writing and making cartoons, kids can smell fake from a mile away. They can know when adults are pandering to you. And if you are, are if you're all, if you're in the mindset of, I am trying to figure out what kids like, and therefore that's what we're going to make. You're already failed. Yeah. Uh, the only thing you can do is be honest and, um, and have authenticity in your writing. And that comes through. And I think those are the things that kids connect the most with than just, let's just say, if I can use this word on your, on your show, fart jokes. Um, there's a time and a place for them, but when they're all over the place, because you think that's what kids are going to laugh at, then you've, you've already failed. Um, and that was one of the things about the loud house is, is, you know, it started off as an animal cartoon. It was about a boy rabbit who had 25 sisters and over the course of developing it, it turned into humans. And when it turned into humans, something clicked. I started to pull from my own life. Um, whereas when it was just animals, I didn't, but when I pulled from my life and the stories and the things that happened as a kid growing up to me and my family started to make their way into the writing, it started to have that authenticity. And I think that that's what made the show um, successful to uh, people who are watching it. And that's the, the key is kids would watch it, but we would also get 
uh, letters from adults saying, hey, I was watching your show with my kids and I find myself watching it more than they do. Like it was one of those things where across the age groups, it was kind of hitting. And that to me, it, it, it triggered that, that notion of like, right, we had it right. It was about authenticity and it was about being honest with what we were doing. And we weren't trying to make a show for kids. We were just trying to make a mm. good show with good storytelling, clearly. So that's interesting. So then do you think that if that's your mindset and that's where you were inside of that culture, do you think that that's where people are in the grooming aspect right now is just something that follows with their worldview and it's not necessarily nefariously thought up? Okay, here's where we want the kids to be. It's just that that's their worldview and that's just bleeding out into it. Or is there a nefarious plot? There's probably both. Okay. It's hard to say. Um, you know, everybody can can kind of pick apart what you're doing in hindsight, uh, and and apply um, uh, their their worldview to what you've done as if you started out doing it that way. There are some shows that are on Netflix, for example, that that caused me to um, cancel my subscription. That I feel like, gosh. Well, what is it with everybody? Is everything's got to have Satan in it or some sort of um, gender ideology or politics in it? And I was like, how is this stuff for kids? And I believe that currently, and I could be wrong, I haven't been in the industry for six years. I believe currently people are chosen not for their ideas, but for their ideology and for their ethnic background, we'll say, or whatever, in this desire to have diversity, people are being chosen for their diversity over their talent and experience. And what comes through are shows that are just really, like I did, made for themselves and mm. hopefully somebody will like it, but their points of view are so narrow that their entire uh their existence relies on their identity that they don't know how to do anything but sell that. That's all they know. Whereas, especially with the Loud House and the people who were on it, we were about family and we were about experience, not the fact, let's say, for example, the spinoff show from the Loud House was called the Casa Grandes. Yeah. And it was about a Mexican-American family. And um, it could have easily fallen into the the punchline being mexican but we said no 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 no. that's just the flavor of the show but the show is about multi-generational family living in this apartment building together and that is more universal than i don't i don't know mexican i don't know what their what their culture is or their um the way they do things or the way they think about things so it would have been false of me to try and sell that idea those ideologies um, and the culture. But when you tell your stories based on universal experiences, such as having siblings or having your grandma living with you or you're living with your aunts and uncles, that kind of storytelling is is more honest and more um, relatable than Mexican. And I just, you know, I had an awesome conversation with Jorge Gutierrez, which is a, he's an animation professional and also Mexican American. And he actually said, he read a script that I wrote for the Casa Grandes and he said, just don't make Mexican the punchline. And it just like, it's like, yes, I get it now. I understand it now. So long story short, I think a lot of people are bringing, making, trying to make ideology, the punchline and people just don't relate to that. They want to relate to characters, not, um, who or what, if I can say that now, who or what the character thinks they are. Um, <laughs> visually, ideologically speaking. Um, how, 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 you, um, how are you thinking now? I mean, so that's really helpful. Is, is that, um, how is that impacting what you want to be working on now? How is that uh, <laughs> impacting on uh, you know what you want to be doing next? Or maybe even what you would like encourage other uh, creators who maybe want to be breaking into this industry. Um, how would you encourage them? Like what should, what should they be aiming for? Particularly believers. Okay. Um, again, cut to me being a, a new believer and a, uh, a person without, uh, the, the work that 
I had spent my whole life doing. Um, and I started when I felt when I felt forgiven and I felt loved and I felt the grace from God, I felt comfortable enough to ask, like I had squandered this gift that he had given me of, of, of this talent of being able to tell stories in an animated sense of drawing these things. I felt comfortable enough to just maybe ask like, Lord, I know I squandered these gifts. And this is a, is a prayer I have constantly. I know I squandered these gifts, but if you, if it is in your will for me to use these gifts again and my new uh, uh, belief in Christ and, and, and you, God, like, can you bring people into my life who will help me to use these gifts in a way that glorifies you, mm-hmm. God? Mm-hmm. And that's been my prayer. And, you know, I've been praying it for uh, like six years now. And I think one of the things God is teaching me is like, I feel like maybe he's saying yes, but he's also saying patience, young, young one. Um, <laughs> like, but it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a patient kind of game, but again, he's been there. He's, he's provided for my family and I, uh, this whole time. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I feel like I know I spoke of ideology and, and, um, and things like that being put into a cartoon. Fortunately, God is not an, 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 an idea. Um, so I don't feel like I'm doing the same things, but I do feel like there, there is many ways to go about it. Some Christian content is about evangelizing and some Christian content is about um, entertaining those who already believe Unfortunately, the, some of the stuff that's made for those who already believe is a little bit black and white, which is like, you know, atheist bad, Christian good, and and like, boy, who is like, who is this even for? Like, we're already, <laughs> for lack of better terms, drinking that Kool Aid. You don't need to sell us on this stuff. Like, who is this stuff really for? But more importantly, I felt like because of where I was with TV animation and Nickelodeon and Disney, that that was a group that I felt comfortable talking to. And I felt they were underrepresented as far as having content for them. You've got VeggieTales on the, on the far end of like really young toddler uh, audience. And then you've got the God's not dead type movies for the older, as Lure puts it, soccer moms. Um, <laughs> but there was this, this place in the middle where six year olds through like maybe even 18, there's nothing being made for them. And like, mm-hmm. this is where I want to focus is make stuff that, I want to watch when I was that age, but also have the, the, the faith thread running through it. Nobody wants to be preached to, especially in a cartoon, but you can put that element in there, uh, Christian morals, et cetera, in there. And not sneakily, I don't mind being overt about it, but in a way that is entertaining and part of the storytelling and not just shoving, uh, my beliefs down the throat of somebody who may or may not believe it the same way. Um, so, you know, to get to, to your, to your question about, about giving advice to people, especially Christians who want to do these things is the good thing is it still applies. The same advice is be honest and be authentic. And as a Christian, you should be both of those things. So hiding your Christianity uh, it, because you're afraid of what people are going to think about you is the wrong way to go about it. You got to just present it in the same kind of pride that you feel when you go to church every Sunday. You always feel great after church. It's that real church high, which of course fades throughout the week. But there's a feeling that you get that there's somebody on stage that's like conveying the message to you in a way that just makes you feel full. And I mean full in a religious sense, like like the Holy Spirit is just singing in you. And like, yeah, you can do that with cartoons too if you're honest about it. Um, and again, kids, they can smell a rat a mile away. If you're being um, pandering to them, it's not going to happen. Um, and so, you know, like I said, God bringing the right people into my life has been something that's happened. And Lure was brought into my life. Uh, um, and I've t- you know testified to that as well, is that, it was brought into my life in a way that just like only God can do. And um, uh, it, it, it connected with my, with the cartoons I watched as a youth, the Rocky and Bullwinkle. 
you know, in the, I have to admit, guys, that, like in the last six years, I haven't watched any cartoons. It just is like extremely <laughs> painful to see all of my, I would just say, ex coworkers, colleagues, friends continuing to do the thing that I love so much and to feel good about seeing that. It just hurts too much to watch. But one day, and I'll make it quick, I just happened to push play on a uh, Mr. Peabody and Sherman cartoon, which I don't know why I did. And it's about history. It's about these, this dog and a boy that go back in history to correct history gone crazy. And it just like occurred to me, like, I can do this with the Bible. I don't know the history that they're talking about, but when I was finished watching the episode, which was about Geronimo of all things, I learned that he had to sign some sort of peace agreement. I didn't know that or a treaty. Like, well, I, I learned something from this cartoon. I wonder if I can do that with the Bible. And then the, the show just came together. The busted Bible stories kind of playing off the fractured fairy tales um, alliteration. And the characters kind of came into fruition. And it was one of those situations. Like, I'm not a fast writer. I'm not uh, someone who can bang out a script in a, in a day. But it's one of those things where just everything just started coming out in a way that was like, yes, this felt right. And to be writing that and, and doing the, the, the pitch presentation for it, and then to have Lure kind of come in at an angle and right as that was being finished, just was like, yeah, only God's timing. Only God's timing could do that. That If I wasn't a Christian, it would have been me telling this story saying, what luck that they would have called right at this time. But it was God. He, he, he lined it up for me. And again, it's been a year and a half since we first spoke, um, Jason uh, Farley at Lure. And again, it's God saying, yes, but patience, just be patient. And that's what I've been trying to be, mm -hmm. patient with okay. his time. Yeah, that's great. Hey, so Chris Savino author .com is the website. Chris Savino author .com to check out more things with Chris. Chris, it was great hearing your testimony. It's yeah. so good to have that. The, it's so good to know the Lord has regenerated you and made you new. Look forward to Amen. seeing how God decides to use you in the future, brother. Thanks for coming on the Thank show. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. If you're single, get married. If you're married, have you some kids. And if you have kids, go baptize them. Until tomorrow, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go fight, laugh, and feast. This is Cross Politic. Home. It's where you build your legacy. Where traditions are started, seeds are planted, meals are shared, and stories are told. We are Chris and Natalie Carpenter, owners of Story Real Estate, and our team of top agents helps people find homes in Moscow, Idaho, and around the country. Have you thought about a move? Contact us to get connected with a top agent who shares your values and puts your family first. Or reach out to us about our Moscow Relocation Guide. Wherever you're looking to go, we can help you find home. Call us at Story Real Estate or visit us at storyrealestate.com and start building your legacy.